And now, from the CFTK TV studios, this is Open Connection with your host, Robert Picto. Welcome to Open Connection, your host, Robert Picto. Our show today comes to you from the traditional and unceded territory of the Sibshan people. A territory acknowledgement honors the deep relationship between indigenous peoples and the traditional lands and territories. It recognizes the significance and of our individual relationships with it. We begin today's open connection as MLA Rustad recalls a time he mispronounced the name of indigenous community. Uh, at one point when I was Minister for Aboriginal Relations and Reconciliation, I came up here and I recognized the wrong traditional territory. And the chief came up to me and, and afterwards and kind of made a joke out of it and said, I'll let you get away with it this time, but if you ever come up and do that again, you're going to have to buy a feast for the community. So I figured your lax clam was about 2,000 people. That would have been quite a, quite a tag. So I decided I better make sure I get it right uh, when I come up to communities. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about uh, some of the work that I did uh, as, uh, as minister. Uh, and then uh, I want to talk about uh, some of the challenges that uh, that work is facing today. And I'm really proud of the work that, uh, that we did uh, when I was minister. Uh, we signed, um, I signed about 435 agreements with First Nations. And in particular for LNG uh, coming into the Prince Rupert area, with the agreements that we signed, it would have meant about $2 billion in benefits to the First Nations. $2 billion, and that's just from government. And you're talking about the deals that would have been done with the LNG companies and the pipeline companies with the First Nations. Um, and uh, all of those benefits would likely have been in the vicinity of $4 billion. That is a very large number. Now you think about it. We had chiefs that were signing those agreements that were in tears. They were signing it because they could finally give their youth hope. They might finally be able to stop suicides. They might finally be able to move from managing poverty to managing an opportunity for their nation, for their people, to be able to support their culture, to be able to support who they were. And the reality is, and the unfortunate part is, none of those projects other than the LNG Canada have really a hope to go forward right now with the environmental policies that are in place. And that's a real tragedy. And that's why I want to talk about this, because it's so important when you think about what it means for people on the ground, the difference it can make for nations. You know, you got a chance to hear a lot from Heisler. You can imagine what life would have been like without LNG Canada. Still would have been, they were still on a good path, but it would have been a very different path than it is today. And that opportunity could have been there for so many other nations. And quite frankly, it should be. But we have to fight for it. But in order to fight for it, you have to understand why these projects are stalled out and what the issues are. You know, it's interesting as a politician, if I were to stand up and say, you know, vote for me because I want to bring an end to affordable energy and I want to bring an end to cheap food prices and I want to, you know, reduce food production, contribute to starvation. I mean, what would you say? Would you say, yeah, yeah, that sounds good. Let's vote for that. But that's the reality of the policies that are being brought forward by just about all the political parties today. And they don't say it that way. They call it climate leadership. But that's the reality of what it means. I want to just uh, sort of talk about where things, where we sort of started. And, and what it boils down to is governments Many, many people believe that um, climate change is a threat. Now, I want to stand up here and be very clear, and I'm going to repeat this several times in this presentation. Climate change is real, okay? Uh, lots of people try to accuse me of being a climate denier. I'm not. Climate change is real. But government also believes that CO2 is the primary cause of climate change. And so, of course, because of that, they're saying, well, we got to deal with this, so we better find our policies that are going to reduce CO2. Uh, and of course, then it's backed up by tons of predictions about, you know, doom and gloom and the end of the world associated with, uh, with uh, climate, uh, with our changing climate. And I want to point out some facts. And I love starting with this slide 
because when you look at that map and you look at Canada, 14,000 years ago, Canada, most of Canada was uninhabitable. It was covered by ice. Open Connection will be right back after these messages. And now, from the CFTK TV studios, this is Open Connection with your host, Robert Picto. Thank you for staying with us. According to the Government of Canada's website, Canada's climate is already changing. Higher temperatures, shifting rainfall patterns, extreme weather events, and rising sea levels are just some of the changes already affecting many aspects of our lives. Let us return to the conversation with MLA Rustad. But what you need to know is that there are hundreds of factors that contribute to climate change. Hundreds of factors. And in particular, water vapor in our atmosphere is one of the key things with climate change. It accounts for just about all of it. Um, about 90, 90, well, in the vicinity of 90%, 95%. Some people say a little less. The point though is without water vapor in our atmosphere, the earth would be 30 degrees cooler than it is today. It would be an unhabitable earth. CO2 represents 2%, 2% of the greenhouse impact. That's it. However, because of all these predictions, what they do is they have a model and a theory that there is a feedback loop that creates a multiplier between CO2 and water vapor, which is where all these predictions are of additional warming. Let's take a look at the policies that government has developed uh, associated with, uh, with climate change. And it's one of the ones that uh, got me um, kicked out of my caucus and is now as, a, as an independent MLA, which I don't know if I should say I'm proud about it, but it is unfortunate after putting 22 years into a party, it's, uh, it's a little bit different being, uh, being out as an independent. But one of the things they're talking about is reducing uh, emissions from farms, uh, reducing the use of nitrogen-based fertilizer, reducing cattle herds. Uh, they're worried about emissions from, from, from cattle. Another major policy, which we all live with today, is the carbon tax. And that is meant to try to drive us to using alternatives uh, to using fossil fuels. There's also, uh, uh, we want to limit uh, the emissions that industry can, uh, can put out, uh, putting caps on how much emissions can be in there. And this is a real problem when you think about uh, LNG Canada. Uh, face uh, the next uh, two trades of LNG Canada do not fit within the cap targets. So there's obviously going to be some interesting negotiations uh, as that project uh, goes to proceed. We want to, uh, of course, reduce or eliminate fossil fuels, uh, and I'll, I'll get into that a little bit uh, in uh, in a future slide here. Um, our building code, we want to reduce CO2 emissions from our from buildings. These are the things that are put in place. Uh, of course, using electric vehicles and investing in uh, intermittent, unreliable uh, but renewable power, as it's called. All of these things have consequences. In some cases, unintended consequences. I like to say this story uh, because it's a good example of history. In 1306, England was using what was known at that time as sea coal because it was coal that came in by barge over the sea. And this was particularly was, became a real problem in London because of the air pollution. This was dirty brown coal where people were using it to heat their homes. You know, it was starting to get colder at the time. So the King of England had heard so many complaints about air quality, they said, right, enough. We are going to ban the use of coal in England. This was 1306. And so uh, it only took a few years for them to come to the realization that everybody was going out chopping down trees to burn for their homes to keep it warm. And the amount of deforestation was so dramatic that the king had to reverse his policy. 700 plus years later, they're still using coal in England. But it's interesting today, because to try and move away from coal, there's actually forests, particularly down in the States, that are being chopped down to turn into pellets to head to England for heat. It's interesting how some things don't change. The reduction of fossil fuels is, is really quite an important thing to concept to think about. Are, there are three main things that we need in life. We need housing, we need some sort of shelter, we need food, and we need energy. Those are the three things that contribute to our quality of life. Without them, 
we're in, we're in trouble. We're in serious trouble. And they're finding that out in Europe in, in a big way. But across the world, because we've had affordable energy, 2.4 billion people have been lifted out of abject poverty. 2.4 billion people. Because they finally have access to energy and what that's been able to do. Many people in, in some countries have no more electricity than what it would take to run a refrigerator for a year. But at least they have that to be able to help them as a society and to help them improve. But just think about this. In Africa, 620 million people do not have electricity. 620 million people. And we, and you know, we've got the COP27 going on right now, and the, out of the previous COP26, uh, they came forward with this policy that Canada signed on to that we will not invest in energy policies and fossil fuel energy in Africa. Oh, except for one exception. If it means the transportation of that energy of that source to Europe. Open Connection will be right back after these messages. And now from the CFTK TV studios, this is Open Connection with your host, Robert Picto. Thank you for staying with us. According to the Government of Canada's website, Canada's climate is already changing. Higher temperatures, shifting rainfall patterns, extreme weather events, and rising sea levels are just some of the changes already affecting many aspects of our lives. Let us return to the conversation with MLA Rustad. And you think about our day-to-day -day life, 6,000 goods, thereabouts, come from petroleum products. Everything from our glasses to our, our technology, it's, it's, it's in everything we do in life. There are no replacements. There's no viable options for most of those products. Everything we eat, everything we wear, everything we own has a diesel footprint. And right now, there's a diesel shortage going on in North America. We haven't seen a new refinery built in North America since the 1970s, particularly in the United States. Yet the population is growing dramatically and the demand for fuels keeps growing. We're setting ourselves up for a real problem and it's playing out right now in Europe with what's going on there. Higher energy costs, of course, come off or directly off the bottom line. It means a lower quality of life for all of us. And unfortunately, we've now entered into the era, the end of affordable energy. And that has huge consequences. The carbon tax, of course, is one of the things that's touted by, uh, by governments as being the way forward to, uh, to a greener future. And it's interesting, I'm not quite sure exactly what the definition of green should be, but in any case, uh, it's nonetheless, that's what's being used. So what is that? What is the carbon tax? What does it do? Well, in BC, the carbon tax this year will collect $2.5 billion. What? You think about it, once you start talking about numbers that big, how do you relate to that? A billion dollars? I mean, it's, it's such a large number, $2.5 billion. Well, it's the equivalent of a 20% increase in personal income taxes. And at 170, which is where the target is, it's the equivalent of a 70% increase in personal income taxes. Gas taxes, the carbon taxes, all the other gas taxes. If you drive uh, one of the most common uh, vans uh, in North America, the Dodge Caravan, and you go in to Vancouver and you fill up, you're paying $60 in taxes for that fill up on that tank. $60 every time you go and fill up your tank. It's a big number. It's a lot of impact in terms of us uh, and what we do as a society. The one that, uh, like I say, got me in lots of trouble, which is agriculture, and partly because in my riding, 35% of the economic activity is, is cow-calf operations, uses marginal um, agricultural land for uh, raising cattle, uh, which, of course, is an important piece in, in our food, food chain. And for some reason, governments are thinking that, you know, the passing of wind by cows is a problem for our weather. Um, and the funny thing is, Today, I just or not I mean, just the other week, I read a report. We're actually starting to talk now that our pets and the emissions from our pets is a problem, and we may have to think about capping how many pets we have in the world. Uh, it's quite frankly, it's just gone crazy. But reducing the fertilizer, in particular nitrogen-based fertilizer, is a real problem. Uh, about forty percent of the world's food supply comes because of the benefit of nitrogen-based fertilizer. 
In Sri Lanka, they decided to go with this policy. They eliminated nitrogen-based fertilizer, went to using uh, manure instead. And in the first year, the, the immediate impact was a 30% reduction in their rice crops. 30% reduction in the rice crop. 18% reduction in their, uh, in their primary export product, which is tea. So we think, well, once again, that's just a number. What that means is food prices have gone through the roof. There's starvation uh, and, and in the country. There's civil unrest. 28 politician homes have been burned. The president had to flee the country. You start messing with our food supply, you got a real problem. You got a real problem in our society. 19, in the uh, 1950s, we used to spend 17% of our income on food. One seven percent of our income on food. By the early 2000s, that was down to about 4.5%. The era of cheap food has come to an end as well. These policies that were being imp implemented are leading to help or contributing to this. That will continually go up as a percentage of our food, a percentage of our income that we'll be spending on food in the coming years. It's already been close to a 20, between 20 and 25% increase just over the last two years in food in terms of inflation. And a lot of that can be directly implemented or can be directly traced back to policies and approaches of driving up our costs, particularly on energy, because of course energy has such a big impact. Open Connection will be right back after these messages. And now from the CFTK TV studios, this is Open Connection with your host, Robert Picto. Renewable energy is an energy derived from natural resources that are replenished at a higher rate than they are consumed. Sunlight and wind, for example, are such sources of being constantly replenished. In this final segment of Open Connection, let us return the conversation as MLA Rustad gives some examples of renewable energy. Renewable energy, of course, is something that everybody talks about. You know, this idea that we can go to, to wind and solar. Uh, well, I would suggest that maybe they aren't renewable when you think about what it takes for the input uh, to actually build wind and solar. But it's an interesting option to consider. Germany has spent $800 billion, $800 billion on renewable energy. And they today are now facing the greatest energy crisis that anybody has seen in the modern era. They actually put out a paper to their people telling them how to cook without electricity because they're worried they might not be able to provide electricity for people this winter. In Switzerland, they actually, they actually have passed a law saying that people can't heat their homes above 19 degrees Celsius. And they're actually talking about possible jail time if anybody does. You think about what that is in our society and that change, and that change, and it's all because of quite frankly, these environmental policies. They decided to move away from fossil fuels. They banned the idea of fracking, um, and uh, they went to renewable energies. And for backup, they decided on using natural gas from Russia, which, of course, left them vulnerable. Energy independence is a critical piece of any society being able to support its people. As a world, we've spent $2.7 trillion in the last decade 2.7 trillion dollars. Now that's just an unbelievably large number. And that represents less than 3% of the world's energy consumption. So you think about what it would take to move away from fossil fuels. It is a big, big number. And quite frankly, transition is important, but how you do it's gonna be more important. Now, why are, why are all these things being put in place? So I gotta talk a little bit about CO2 uh, and the history of CO2 because the, what governments are saying is that CO2 is the challenge. So here's a little bit of history from the last 11,000 years. And I'm, I, I promise I won't go too much into the science and bore people with this, but if you look at this graph, what it points out is periods of time where we had these many ice ages or cool periods, periods of time where we had these warm periods. The important thing to note here is that over the life, over the last 11,000 years, there have been five major warming trends, there's been five major cooling trends. What's important is those warming trends and those cooling trends, CO2 levels stayed relatively static. And those warming trends were warmer than it is today. So if CO2 was the driver 
of climate, a, a driver, a particular of, of, of warming, how come CO2 levels stayed the same while those climbs changed? There wasn't a correlation, or, or sorry, there wasn't a causation. It's important to know the difference between correlation and causation. If a butterfly flaps its wings and 100 kilometers away you have a hurricane, that may be correlated, but it isn't causated. It isn't a cause. And this is where CO2 is. We have seen temperatures warm, CO2 levels arise. There's a correlation between those two, but it isn't a causation. At least there is no history going back uh, to show that. And so um, and the other interesting thing to note, just as a side note, I promise I just wouldn't go too much in size. The average level of CO2 in the atmosphere in Earth's history was around 1,600 parts per million. We're around 400, 420 today. Um, if we go to the next slide. Now, here's, here's how scientists have driven this model. What they say is that CO2 has this 2% impact that I talked about at the beginning, but then there's this multiplier, this feedback effect with, um, with va water vapor, which gives them this model that says temperatures are going to rise dramatically because of CO2. The problem is there is no historical evidence to support this. We have very, very good ice cores readings going back uh, almost a million years. Uh, we've got sedimentary cores um, as well to, to support this. CO2 levels have always historically followed temperature, not gone before it. So there is no, the, nobody's been able to create a model today to support it, and there's no historic model. And I was, was talking with a professor that teaches um, climate science at UNBC, and I asked him about this. And what he said, what, and I, I said, well, there's no, there's no evidence. You haven't been able to build a model. There's no historical evidence. And his response was, well, but there's no evidence to suggest it isn't. I just think, you know, in terms of science, that's just a little on the weak side. The other thing important to note is we actually went through quite a significant cooling trend from the late, late mid-1940s to the end of the 1970s. And for anybody that's old enough like me, gray hair, they might remember the word global cooling that came particularly in the 1970s. That doesn't fit the model, of course, because CO2 levels went up quite dramatically all the way through that. And there's other periods that are, that are similar. One of the most important developments in climate actually was the thermometer. And that happened in 1650 in England. And so ever since then, England's been keeping a record of temperatures using the thermometer to measure temperatures. And as you can see along the, uh, the line along the bottom, you can see the variations in temperature that's gone through the years and temperature has increased over that period of time. What's important to note about this is if you go back near the beginning of that, there between the late 1600s and, and about 1730, 1750, there was a significant warming trend. Temperatures increased by two degrees over that period of time, yet there was no change in CO2 levels. If, this was, if there was a direct causation of temperature, what you would see is temperatures going parabolically with the increase in CO2, and they're not. There's no causation. Thank you for joining us for this episode of Open Connection. The greatest distance in the existence of man is not from here to there, but the connection from his mind and heart. If we can conquer that distance, we can soar like an eagle and realize our immensity within. I'm Robert Pictow.